Hello, hello, hello. Uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, good night to you. If you're joining in me from Sydney, Australia, it's about, I think about late midnight here in Bangalore, India. It's seven o'clock, we're doing a live today. And I'm joining Philippa Butler, a chartered physiotherapist, a certified Pilates instructor, a certified Hatha Yoga. I've always wanted to learn Hatha Yoga and she's a meditation teacher. And uh, if you're in New York, it's probably early morning. So good morning to you. This is the menopause initiative where I decided to bring a little bit of information across to you about the wisdom of menopause and at our nutrition clinic at the Kwan Nutrition Clinics where I practice as a nutritionist. Now, if you don't know who I am and you've just kind of stumbled upon this video uh, or this live stream, uh, well, that's amazing. I, I am a nutritionist. Uh, I work with a lot of celebrities in the continent of Asia. And these celebrities include sports athletes, include film stars, industrialists, and many a times very, very, very successful business, business women. Now, today's talk is merging the fields of exercise and diet and nutrition. So I've got a guest uh, who's probably just had a lunch uh, in India, if she was here, she would be called Dr. Philippa Butler as a chartered physiotherapist. So, Philippa, are you around? Have I got a connection through to you? Yes, you certainly do. Hi, good afternoon to you. Hi, good afternoon to you, Ryan. I'm joining you virtually with a cup of tea. Mine's chamomile tea because I got to sleep in about three hours. Have you had your cuppa today? Well, I've had a few. <laughs> I've had a few cuppas already, but uh, water only for me this afternoon. Wonderful. And if people are joining us live on our various Facebook platforms, the purpose of today's discussion with Ryan Fernando, that's me, the nutritionist, and Philippa Butler, the Pilates instructor who's worked with a lot of people. And I'm going to talk about the wisdom of menopause, exercise in menopause, nutrition in menopause. So strap on, let's get seated and discussing on this whole concept of menopause. For me, menopause, as a man of 47 years of age, I work with clients, but I don't understand it a lot of times. Because they say you have to experience menstruation, and then you have to experience the pausing of men menstruation, which is menopause. Mm -hmm. Philippa, if you had to define to the world menopause, what would your take be on it? Ryan, we could be here all day, but uh, what? so the definition is that it's the cessation of menstruation for one year so that, you know, women are considered to be in menopause when they haven't had a period for one whole year. But really, you know, that's the tip of the iceberg because menopause comes to us in advance of that in as much as the shift is occurring way, way in advance of the time when the periods actually come to a halt. And so it's this time when uh, many, many women start to struggle with a whole variety of signs and symptoms that, you know, for the most part, this stuff shouldn't take us by surprise. We should have known about it. We should have been anticipating it. But, you know, people don't talk about this stuff. And so so many women it's a surprise to them when they start to experience symptoms and it's a, it's confusing and people don't know what is happening to them that is women of course so um you know so that's my mission to try and uh, demystify this whole process and to get the dialogue going the more that we can talk about this and share our experiences of menopause because you know they can be as different as each individual in the land. So, uh, so it's really important to talk to a, a whole variety of people and, and just try and get a handle on what it is that you might look, you might be expecting to experience. You know, as a, as a clinical practitioner with diet and nutrition, for me, when clients sit across the table and they, they do come, most women come for fat loss. Well, first they come for weight loss. And uh, once they start exercising and then they do the weight loss, 
that they're like, Ryan, I think my cycle's going haywire. So, Philippa, my question to you would be, um, especially the women in the decade of 40s to 50s, the decade 50s to 60s and 60s to 70s, are there certain signs that a woman should look for in each of these decades? Uh, and what is your wisdom and what is your experience with your clients and you as a woman? What is your personal experience? If you can enlighten us on the three decades, 40 to 50, 50 to 60, and maybe 60 to 70. Yes, of course. And, uh, and certainly it's in your 40s when these shifts begin to occur. The shifting uh, hormonal levels start to occur. And for a lot of women, it's around the age of 45. And, and that was my experience, that at the age of 45, uh, something was definitely afoot, something was happening. And so for me, uh, it began really with gradually was the other thing so that it can kind of creep up on you a little bit. And so the symptoms that I experienced was sleeplessness, insomnia, really having, uh, and, and not so much that I couldn't go to sleep, but that I couldn't stay asleep. And I, I was waking regularly through the night. Um, so so yes. can I interrupt you here for the, the people that are listening in, the women that are listening in, they're watching the live or the recorded later. Mm -hmm. Would you say that a lot of women face this issue of uh, a sleep ir irregularity? Yes, it's actually very common. Um, and, and so women who have never experienced difficulty sleeping before, I think the experience is that they, they may not necessarily realize when they wake that they haven't been sleeping quite as well, but they feel fatigued in the morning when they wake up, or you are aware that you've been disturbed in the night. And, uh, and for me, I was waking something like six to eight times every night, which was unusual for me. Needless to say, fatigue is a symptom of menopause. And, and that gets very much tied in with this sort of sleep deprivation that a lot of women are experiencing. Um, you know, and, and sleep is so restorative, we need sleep. So Philippa, if you were sitting across the counseling table for a diet plan with me, now I would be listening to this from a clinical perspective. Oh, she's got sleep problem. Oh, she's got fatigue. So I would add a small layer from a nutrition department, which would be, hey, Philippa, could we check your vitamin B complexes in your blood? Could we check your DHEA, which goes low in women during menopause as a blood test? And maybe can we also look at vitamin C and vitamin D? And there's another thing, as you're growing older, you tend to deposit more fat around your abdominal area. So when you lie down, so if you're standing, when you lie down, your gut tends to push up on your diaphragm. So there's another part of sleep apnea also setting in. So there was this research where when people lost about 4% body fat, uh, on, on the entire body, especially uh, the neck uh, girth came down, then the clogging of the, um, the, th the, the throat when breathing at night uh, reduced uh, the, the, uh, the snoring, which caused intermittent sleeping. So you go into deep sleep, you choke <clears throat> and then get up. So there's menopause, which is sleep and fatigue, which you're talking to me about. And I would come in from the biochemistry part and say, hey, lady, could we kind of get uh, a nutritional check and see if any of these are going low? Because they would be going low because of the hormonal cycle. Yeah, so and I mean, I think that's really important, actually, because these kinds of complaints, my experience was... I mean, let me just be quite clear, that was not the only symptom that I had, but we are talking about sleep just now. And, uh, and so if you did go to your doctor complaining that sleep was disturbed or disrupted, um, you know, first of all, they may not even acknowledge that menopause is a feature. And secondly, it's unlikely that you would be in any way investigated in true, the first place. True, so, very, very, very true because it's like, oh, it's okay. It's part of your age and stuff like that. And and for me as a nutritionist, I'm looking at the biochemistry cycles. So there is a fluctuation between cortisol uh, levels, your estrogen levels and all of these, and they're all interlinked. But there are some quick tips and fixes that I would give women out there, which would be one, 
chamomile tea. Research has shown that chamomile tea gives you a deeper sleep. Have a chamomile tea about three hours before you're going to sleep. That's one. Second is kiwi fruit um, and walnut and tart cherries. These three are nature's sleeping aids. They contain a higher level of melatonin as compared to other foods. So Philippa, if women were out there, I would put a note down and say, okay, maybe with your chamomile tea uh, around 6.37 in the evening, have a walnut or two. Uh, and then the final thing is an amino acid called melatonin mm -hmm. uh, uh, at around 1.5 milligrams to about 3 milligrams. It's a nutritional supplement. So women who are going through this transitional period uh, where a million dollar question, Philippa, has your sleep improved now over the years? Well, um, I'm, I'm afraid to say I'm a kind of a lifelong non-sleeper. Uh, okay. And so, you know, this is a complicated issue for me personally, but, um, you know, my experience is that now that I'm 54 and I'm, I'm... You don't look 54. Oh, well, thank you for saying that. <laughs> That's the only reason I mentioned it, of course. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm, you know, I'm well through that time now in the perimenopausal fluctuating period. And so, yes, you know, there is a suggestion that symptoms can settle uh, after that time. And so certainly it is much improved uh, in comparison to how it was. But, you know, I have to be perfectly honest, Ryan, and tell you that I had to resort to hormonal replacement therapy for me to be able to get to that place. And, you know, and so you, you can see that I'm, I'm not carrying um, weight around my neck and I'm, I'm hopefully, uh, you can see, I'm not carrying weight around my middle. Um, you know, so, so that there are always the exceptions that prove the rule, but these hormonal fluctuations are going on, uh, even in the most healthy specimen. And, um, and you know, so it, so it is important to be able to, have uh, access to this kind of information, which is why I'm here chatting with you today. Awesome. So uh, for anyone listening in, we're talking about sleep fatigue. It could be linked to your B12 deficiency. It could be linked to melatonin deficiency. In fact, um, Philip, I'm working with uh, Dr. Stephen Dominic, who is a very famous a doctor from Austria who's written a book called The Alkaline Cure. Mm -hmm. And we were just having an offline discussion on the health of the microbiome. We've got lots to discuss today, but oh, yeah. sleep is also controlled in your microbiome and mm -hmm. your microbiome, which is all that bacteria in your gut, nearly two kgs of it and trillions of them actually chomp on your food when you feed it. And during the, the, the transition from perimenopause to menopause, there's a lot of gut imbalance because of the hormonal fluctuation. In fact, women have told me that when they are in normal menstruation cycle in younger years, during the periods of menstruation or the days prior to menstruation, they do have bloating. Some women come to the extent of even having loose motions during their periods. And you, you kind of think, well, what's the menstruation got to do with your digestive system, your, your gut system going out of toss? But research is now showing that your microbiome significantly controls your sleep, controls your mood, controls the longevity or delay of menopause in women. So uh, when you talk about hormonal therapy, I'm thumbs up when it comes from a doctor. Neither you nor me um, are, are equipped or qualified to figure out the hormonal balance after blood tests, which is why we would talk about exercise today and we talk about nutrition today. And that's something that I believe every woman is not addressing and they're jumping straight away into the medical treatment and leaving aside nutrition on the plate to, well, you know, I've eaten a certain way in my 20s to 40s, so I need to kind of just continue that. Uh, so cool, um, you've, you've def defined a few um, stuff to me, but there's so much more, there's hot mm -hmm. flashes, and there's, uh, you know, pain in the body, uh, there's lack of sexual desire, some women getting sexual desire more, uh, there's, uh, loads of uh, body fat getting deposited in areas that, and, and this is the number one question I get when people walk into my Qua Nutrition Clinics is, 
I'm putting on weight, I'm putting on weight, I'm putting on weight. And in our part of the world, which is India, uh, women take care of the family first. I think they do that everywhere. But mm-hmm. over here, uh, the, the, the predisposition to take care of yourself first, first, take care of yourself first, and then you're, you're fit enough and, and, and your, your health is good enough to take care of the rest of your family uh, is not a notion. So let's start about taking care of the body, Philippa, with you. What are the, what are the things that you are advising women beginning to start perimenopause and getting into menopause? How important is exercise for them? Well, it's, it's absolutely crucial. It's crucial at every stage of life, but never so important as in midlife. And actually, we can gain as much, if not more, if we take up regular exercise in the middle of our lives than if we've been doing it all along. And so, you know, this is, doesn't age doesn't have to be a barrier, is what I would say. And, uh, you know, and the thing with exercise is, for some people, it's a dirty word. Uh, for me, it's my absolute and utter passion. And it's something that I've done for my own health and well-being for the whole of my life, since I was a child, in actual fact. Uh, I was inspired to start sport, sporting pursuits when I was only a child, and that was because of my family influences. But you know, for the most part, women and sport, it tends to be that if you do sport as a woman, it tends to go into a decline uh, after the school years. And uh, for the majority of women, exercise is not necessarily a feature of every day. And that, you know, women are busy, like you said, they're busy taking care of everybody else. And it's really hard to carve out time for yourself in the middle of the day or in the evening or, you know, whenever it is. But it's so, so important. And, uh, you know, and so my mission is to share the power of movement with as many women, as many people as possible. Uh, You know, and for me, my passion is Pilates. It was my first love. Uh, 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 When I came to Pilates, it was about 16 years ago. And um, and I came to Pilates because actually I, I hurt my back when I was working as a physiotherapist. And, uh, and it was something that a colleague of mine introduced me to in the physiotherapy department, uh, therapeutic or clinical Pilates. And, uh, and so that started me on my journey with Pilates. And, you know, I had my first training course only a weekend. And at the end of the weekend, my back pain was feeling a whole lot better. And I was kind of like, oh, my goodness, you know, this is so, incredible stuff. So, so Philippa, because we've got quite a number of people watching in. I don't know what is Pilates. What is Pilates? I'm hearing this term for the first time. I'm a nutritionist. What is Pilates? Is it a dance that I do or something like that? No. Well, do you know what? Uh, Joseph Pilates was a gentleman and uh, he was German by descent. And uh, in actual fact, the majority of his career was spent in New York and he did work with Um, prima ballerinas so there are quite a few dance influences in Pilates and uh, Pilates is really just a series of exercises but Pilates is much more about the how how do we move how do we do these exercises these exercises Pilates is about body position or body alignment Pilates is about core activation or the core muscles uh, and why is why is this important for women in menopause? I mean, why is the core important? Could, could as a physiotherapist, could you tell me? Because you know, when I tell my clients as nutritionists, you need to do Pilates, you need to do yoga. Do you know you're growing older and your fat is getting larger and larger, and your muscles getting smaller and smaller? And muscle is the only age reversible organ for a woman going through menopause. So if she can grow more muscle, yeah. she would she would hold back on the fat growing out of range. Mm. So, um, you know, tell me a little bit more about how Pilates is going to help the core and stuff like that. Well, because we apply the mind muscle connection and specifically to the deep layer of muscles that surround the spine, the the center of the body. And if we can, um, you know, because those muscles actually, the, the core muscles for the most part are stability muscles. And the muscles that automatically should 
switch on as we go about our daily lives. If you stand on one leg to reach a high shelf, you know, without the core, you would fall over. So, so those muscles are automatic, but for lots of people, they kind of forget how to work. I, I'm thinking of a woman who's 55 reaching up on a, and, oh. uh, and to take a bottle off the shelf in the kitchen. And yeah. is this where this, the hip problem and the bone problem, and I fell down and broke my hip later, is it linked to menopause? And can we then maybe discuss with all our viewers how important it is to maybe muscle train, a weight train, and then you have, you know, Philippa, I see you right now as a card dealer. You've got all your cards over there. You've got Pilates, you've got yoga, you've got weight training, you've got uh, running, you've got marathon. Uh, what else? I mean, uh, what should a woman going through menopause do? Because she's got seven days a week. Should she work out all seven days? And how much of time should she devote to her body? in Pilates or anything else that we just, I'm asking you about? Well, for the most part, exercise needs to be regular for the benefits to be realized and maintained. So it's really unfortunate. And did you know it's the same with nutrition? If we don't stick to the plan, then things start to go awry. And so with movement, it really is a, a, a practice for life. It's a practice for every day and it's a practice for life. So, you know, in an ideal world, we would do something every day. But what I would say is five days out of seven that you should be doing something. Yeah, five days. So, so, so I'm doing this because, Philippa, when this video gets recorded and goes back onto our YouTube channels, it's going to pop up here on the side. You got to work out five days a week. And for how long? Well, you know, there's, there's lots of different guidance out there, but um, you're looking somewhere in the region of 30 minutes, five times a week. Um, and maybe, you, you know, that's, that's kind of a minimum, really. I mm. like, do you know what I like, Ryan? I like counting my steps. I like counting my, yeah, I've got one too. There you go, it's hiding. I'm at 5,000 today because I'm standing up and, and doing my lecture with you. Uh, but but just, just one thing that I want to get our audience in over here, and I've got my team running this live. Um, comment on the live how many steps you do in a day, number one. And as a woman, if you're watching this, how much of time in a workout could you devote to your body for a workout? Is it 30 minutes? Philippa, the expert, the Pilates expert, the chartered physiotherapist, the person who has gone through menopause, mm -hmm. she is the expert here, not me, I'm just a nutritionist. She's saying you need to do more than 30 minutes, 30 to 40 minutes as a nutritionist. I would say, well, if you could do 40 minutes to one hour of resistance training, Pilates training, yoga training, I would give that. But most women turn around and say, uh, Mr. Fernando, I, you don't run a house, we run a house, we run a husband, we run our children. So you have no idea, we have no time for ourselves, you know? So uh, uh, just, just, just give us the diet, right? So please comment on the links below. And if any women out there have any questions, please punch them in. I'm gonna ask them to Philippa. So hopefully your question on exercise can get answered. Coming back to you, Philippa. Um, so, <laughs> Well, you know, you were talking about how much should we move, but, but really we do need to break it down into the types of things that we're doing because not all exercise is equal, sadly. And you did make a reference to muscle mass. Building muscle mass is so, so important. Um, and particularly for women, we, you know, we reach peak muscle mass in our late twenties. You know, that Philippa, was why, do, why don't you look like Arnold Schwarzenegger? Because women always tell me, I can't do weight training. I will become a bodybuilder. And I'm like, no, oh, yeah. you can't. So could you like, I love that you're telling me that women should weight train. Tell me about more about this weight training and muscle mass. Well, you know, particularly with Pilates, what we're doing with is working muscles in a lengthened position, in a lengthened fashion. And so resistance training, uh, like Arnold Schwarzenegger, and actually I'm a huge fan of Arnold Schwarzenegger, and I love muscles. muscles. I'll be back. Yeah. So, um, but you know, to, in order to generate that peak, the peak of muscle, as my son who's bodybuilding calls it, you know, 
you, you work muscles into a shortened position in order to generate that effect. And so we can totally get strong without getting bulky if that's what women are worried about. And in actual fact, you know, you know, the muscle drives the metabolic rate. And so the more muscle mass we got, the, the, the more our metabolism is working in our favor. You know, Philippa, I've got a few comments going live on our, our Facebook channels. And we've got Gautami and uh, Anupa talking about doing 8,000 steps in yoga. So to a lot of women out there doing the yoga, mm -hmm. I would come in and say, research has shown twice a week and philippa you can you can agree or you know say it's more or less but twice a week weight training for 45 minutes and, and for me muscle is the only age reversible organ and and i would come in here and tell the audience that i use this line always in my counselings i'm like you know in america they had these two buildings and it was an old age uh, home in the basement of one they gave them a gaming studio and an entertainment center and in the other basement they put in a gym so the the old age people were 70 plus they started grumbling about oh the other buildings got a gaming center and you've given us a gym but the scientists prevailed and gave them some incentive and they took biopsies of the quadricep muscle the quadricep muscle is the muscle uh, you know above uh, uh, just near your knee and they found out uh, they did it for both the groups and they said, okay, the group that had the entertainment center, hey guys, hey ladies, all of you old people, you know, uh, enjoy yourself, watch TV, play games, play uh, bridge and stuff like that. In another place, they, they made them do leg extensions, which is basically an exercise. And they walk them through a 40 minute, three times a week weight training regime, and another three times a week, slow walking on a treadmill. Six months later, Philippa and everybody who's tuned in, Six months later, these average 72 year olds, the group that was entertained, their muscle biopsy grew older. But the scientists were astonished when they took the muscle biopsy of the group that started weight training. They had regressed by six years in age in the muscle biopsy. So for me, that is proof in the pudding saying to everybody going through menopause, pick up a set of dumbbells, pick up a set of resistance tubes, find a person like Philippa Butler. I'm going to be putting her contact details, her website, so you can email her, you can get in touch with her, you can watch her online videos, her online classes, and figure out how you can do more what I call as muscle training. Philippa, back to you. Any other words of wisdom from the exercise world? Well, you know, you, you mentioned that two times a week. So it's two or three times a week to do resistance training. It's two or three times a week to do mobility, flexibility type training. What is uh, mobility? Mobility. Well, improving the range. Is it dancing? Of, well, it could be, like I said, again. Uh, but it's basically the, the, the amount of movement that you have in each joint in your body. And, you know, in an ideal world, we should put every joint in our body through its full range of motion every day. And, uh, you know, I can pretty much guarantee nobody is doing that. <laughs> but, you know, if, if use it or lose it, as the saying goes, it's, you know, it's absolutely and utterly true. There's no I love that line. Use it all lose it yeah. so we are talking about this to women women have fat women have bone women have muscle mm -hmm. if you don't use your muscle and if you don't stimulate your bone to to become denser through resistance training you're going to lose it these are wise words from your certified pilates instructor philippa butler now philippa i want to bring in something about nutrition over here mm -hmm. uh, research has shown that most women want to take up dieting when they go through menopause because they're putting on weight yeah. right uh, yeah. they're gaining weight first thing to women who are much younger not going through menopause right now this is a a fact women will gain one to two kgs or two to four pounds of weight in any given day in any given month when they're going through a menstruation cycle so the first thing I advise women is do not stand on the scale first thing in the morning and oh my God, I've gained one kg of weight and then you decide whether that's a bad day or that's a good day. 
So this is the first perspective of controlling your body from a nutrition expert and from an exercise expert. The fluctuation of one to two kgs is natural. Mm. Number one. Number two, from a nutrition perspective, when people go on a diet and they lose weight, they are not aware of the percentage of body fat and the percentage of muscle. So my recommendation to every woman out there is gift yourself this Christmas a weighing scale. And when you're buying that scale from the department store, say, hey, buddy, does this weighing scale have a body fat percentage calculator? And will it tell me my muscle mass? Does it sync to my phone so I can get that data? And does it tell me my visceral fat? Visceral fat is the fat around the organs, which for most menopausal women is the biggest threat for cardiovascular disease and hypertension. Yeah. So if you can keep your visceral fat down in the single digit, so you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So up to nine, if I meet a woman, I'm like, don't worry, ma'am, it's absolutely fine. If you walk 10,000 steps a day, 10,000 steps a day, that's weight maintenance. Oh, Mr. Ryan, I walk 6,000 steps a day, I walk 8,000 steps a day, but I'm not losing any weight. 10,000 is weight maintenance. If you want to eat into your fat, You've got to go beyond 10,000 steps. Now, Philippa and I and you all use cars today. We use elevators. So we've got to take the time out because if we don't use it, we're going to lose it. Lose it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, the first thing we should do is think about composition, as you say, uh, because weight, weight is a very um, crude measure. Um, you know, just on its own, it's a number, like you say, and it fluctuates on a daily basis. Um, I, I really am wanting to encourage people to think about how they feel and, uh, you know, weight training, it's going to really shift that brain chemistry. It's going to make us feel better when we feel better, we're more motivated to stick to the healthy life choices that we know we need to make. And so, you know, the thing that I've experienced for my own self is low mood with, with menopause. And, and that can really fuel that cycle of mood and uh, low mood and retrieving food from the biscuits barrel that maybe isn't quite as healthy as we would like. So boost your mood with movements is the other thing, you know. So that's a very valid point. Boost your, your mood. And uh, I, I think uh, every woman who goes through menopause uh, will have uh, the fluctuations of the mood. Uh, research is showing that exercise plays a key role in balancing cortisol levels and uh, blood circulation too. Um, I, I've actually seen uh, very, very fit marathon runners, very, very fit people like Philippa who are instructors, uh, they, they, they understand that they can use exercise as a drug. It's a very powerful drug. Exercise is a very powerful drug. In, in fact, um, uh, the reason uh, I got online with Philippa is that I've understood that yoga, Pilates, these are very powerful for women uh, in terms of the core strength, the bone strength, and even something like yoga, which your different poses actually uh, massage your internal organs mm -hmm. and I think even you the audience knows that exercise is important but I think there's a there's a slip between the cup and the lip in terms of do I have the time am I making the time for my body uh, and, and and how important it is so today me and Philippa teamed up to try and convince you that like you spend time getting a shower like you spend time visiting the parlor, like you spend time doing your shopping, like you spend time maybe tucking your kids in, like you spend time going for a walk with your spouse. You need to have your me time. And your me time is not only maybe having a cuppa, but your me time is also saying, let me get to the gym and let me become superwoman. Because I think this is really important. If you know your muscle percentage, you can significantly use your muscles to get your body into into shape and 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 it is the hormones that are not cooperating with you but if you do train 
and not become a couch potato, you will see that you'll walk through your menopause far easier. And research shows this. Women who exercise through their perimenopause and the initial phases, including hot flushes, significantly improve uh, on, on the perspective of exercise. So I guess it is important for us to talk about how we fuel that, that growth. How do we fuel those muscles? Because, you know, exercise is part of the equation. Well, you know, I like to think it's half of the equation at least, but you know, nutrition is undoubtedly a source of confusion for lots and lots of people. And so we want to fuel the body for, for muscle and bone. So, so Philippa, if, if somebody comes into me, um, so let's say you're coming in, you're my client, right? Oh. And I would say, hey, Philippa, let's get a blood test done. You'd be like, Ryan, why do I need a blood test? Well, I'd like to know your vitamins and minerals, right? Mm -hmm. Now, when you reach menopause age, you need to understand that you're, you're a good three, four, five decades into your life. Yes. And if you're into those many decades, your digestive system is like kind of tired and saying, you know what? Oh, you've given me a glass of milk. Let me decide if I want to absorb this calcium or not. So with a blood test, we know transient levels. The second thing, Philippa, now in 2021 and 2022, we have got genetic testing, um, nutrition genetic testing. So I have found out that we can check all the nutrition markers. For example, uh, folic acid, vitamin B9 is so important for moods. Vitamin B6 and niacin are so important for lowering cholesterol. Now, what if you're born with a gene that doesn't absorb niacin well? and you have a high cholesterol now suddenly doctor is giving you statin yeah. in your menopause and because you're taking statin it has a long-term effect on your muscle health so you tend to get fatigued and tired now i need to give you coenzyme q10 but i'm deviating over here coming back genetic test i come to know whether you're lactose intolerant gluten intolerant so should you want to be making these educated scientific decisions rather than oh you know Bertha my neighbor she followed this intermittent fasting and lost five kgs so if Bertha could lose five kgs I'm going to go on to Bertha's diet mm -hmm. it's bio individual in 2021 mm -hmm. I, I was I was I was wearing a um, um, glucose monitor recently I'm not diabetic but I was shocked to find out for me white rice gives me a sugar spike but potatoes don't give me a sugar spike I was gobsmacked I was gobsmacked. So I'm now changing my diet in that direction. So maybe Philippa, you may at some point want to wear a continuous glucose monitor to understand your sugar fluctuations because you will get cravings. And I want you to eat dark chocolate. And I want when you take, um, when you have a sugar craving, uh, I, I, I look at, oh, oh, Philippa has got magnesium deficiency. Oh, she's got a little bit of pre-diabetic range let's work on the diet that way so this is what i would do with the genetic testing and the the blood testing your thyroid you know do i look at the hormones i work with a with a with a gynecologist because oh. the moment you start working at hormones there's a huge debate out there because of the fluctuation in perimenopause and then maybe menopause they disappear uh, you, you're not going to get much inputs other than the doctor trying to put you on hormonal therapy, which is the call of the doctor. However, mm -hmm. I'm asking the women out there, would you not like to try looking at putting the nutritional deficiencies in place, which, you've never, which you may have never done your entire life? So look at focusing it from, can I put healthier food in my body? And whether you're in New York, Sydney, or in India, or in London, I do not care food has changed in the last 30 years in terms of its nutritive content and its chemical content mm -hmm. chemical from a perspective of negative pesticides and insecticides uh, nutritional content from the calcium sodium potassium mag magnesium vanadium manganese whatever nutrients micronutrients that a woman requires so if you have a testing done that works amazingly now, Philippa, if you had a lot of money from your Pilates class, I would say, hey, Philippa, could you kind of give me about 300 pounds and I will do a poop analysis of your microbiome. I will send it to a DNA lab who will analyze all your bacteria and we'll come to a conclusion which foods you should eat or should not eat for the next two, three years of your life. And in that, we start getting four to five kgs weight loss. Right. So yeah. these are scientific ways that women could do it. A blood test, a genetic test, a microbiome test. Uh, what should you be looking for for better nutrition for the muscle? 
flat down plant based protein okay i i do know that uh, in the earlier years we went with dairy which was whey and casein but research is saying that uh, you you're better off with plant based protein uh, vegetarians live longer lesser incidences of ovarian and breast cancer and, and um, for me soy uh, one of the isoflavones uh soy isoflavon so we give it as a nutritional supplement there are in soy there are two isoflavons if i remember correctly gyanitsin and diazin they have an ability to behave like phytoestrogens mm. which help women through menopause there's black cohosh um there's taking more vitamin d philippa you may be amazed if you do uh if you do blood testing of people in in uk uh, and this is a big issue in the uk because uh everyone works with the nhs so you can't kind of go forgive me if i'm wrong over here but you can't just go and ask for a blood test like in india i can walk into a place and they analyze everything and they just do it without a doctor's prescription and i can pay for it and get it so it's a little bit difficult so all my uk based clients are like i've got to go and talk to my doctor and he's going to ask me why do i need a niacin blood test there's nothing wrong with me and, and so i do believe a uh, nutritive medicine medical nutritive medicine is now making a a um a, a comeback and i would advise you to ask your doctor to get that done for you and i would also ask you to get the dhea blood test because in most women this is low and they feel that adrenal fatigue low energy levels and final point from the diet women tend to get this emotional eating after 3 pm to 5 pm it's not got to do with the current generation it's got to do with evolution women have been designed to work with the sun the biological clock with the sun so you need to eat the most amount of food from sunrise to about midday and then your cravings come in the evening because most women are busy in today's world they've got jobs they're working breakfast is very small lunch is almost negligent by 3 o'clock the body is gotten into a, a dip in a drain so if somebody is working out in the morning i advise there was a research done at the university of surrey if i'm not mistaken men should fast and train women should eat and train this is very very important especially in menopausal women so you got to have maybe about 10 20 grams of protein about an hour prior to your training especially if it's resistance training pilates training if it's yoga walking maybe you don't need that much an egg should suffice at 6 grams of protein with a fruit post workout philippa since you're an instructor i would give you 15 to 20 grams of protein in your normal dietary pattern do you need a protein supplement well if you're working with a nutritionist i pride myself when i work with my clients we can achieve it via diet i'm like oh no baby no no but if i eat so much of beans and if i eat so much of things my calories go up i have seen when women begin to eat they gain muscle and listen in closely everyone muscle stores i think about six times more water than fat does so muscle is extremely dense so fat might be this big for 1 pound or 1 kg and muscle might be just this much for 1 kg so you're going to get toned up and to build muscle you've got to give protein about 10 to 15 grams after your workout within a 1 hour window If you don't do this, your muscle is going to be saying, "Hey, this lady really whacked me in this workout, and she was trying to build some muscle." But guess what? Muscle, uh, muscle was like, "Okay, I've got all of this glucose in me. I'm going to burn it off. Great, that's the first twenty minutes, uh, and then you know you got your your very gun ho in your workout, whether it's morning or evening. And then after twenty minutes, the muscle's like, "Hey, let's get some fat into the act." Fat is sitting down over there on the on the couch reading a newspaper, having her cup of tea. It's like, "Ah, oh, darling." I ain't getting out for this lady at all. Let's do one thing: just contact the muscle, ask the muscle to commit suicide, and break down. So you get this. As you start doing weight training, your muscles going down because your diet's not correct. So I need you to get that protein to get your muscle up, and it's the muscle that takes that baton. In India, we call it a lati, and it beats the fat into submission. Now all women say, "Oh wow, this is really good. I'm going to start working out really well tomorrow." But from a perspective, you can lose about 20 grams of fat in a day, which is about 600 grams per month. I want three kgs of fat loss, Mr. Fernando. I am not paying you the big bucks if I don't get three kgs of fat loss. 
It's metabolism. It's not economics. It's as simple as that. Uh, Philippa, are you taking any supplements? Well, Ryan, uh, I supplement with vitamin D uh, in the Western Hemisphere. It's recommended that we take vitamin D every day, particularly between October and April. Um, and I supplement with magnesium. Uh, and, a, you know, an all round women's vitamin is the that's very good. That's very good. So I would advise all women get the blood test. Um, a, a good multivitamin is good. If you're scared about taking a multivitamin, get your physician's advice. When you're looking to multivitamin, your B complex vitamins are very important. Philippa, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, definitely calcium and magnesium are crucial. Uh, one learning that I've had from the gene test in my clinic is that excess of calcium can affect your arterial stiffness or blood pressure from direction and plaque formation. So there are certain individuals on the planet who have a wholesome calcium absorption, which means from your normal food, you'd get enough. So you want to be taking a multivitamin minus calcium. In India, we have 70% of the women who are anemic or iron deficient. Wow. So we want to be taking an iron supplementation. You want to be taking something that's kind in the gut. So the, 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 the modest operandi when, when uh, you know, if you walked into my clinic and says, should I take some more supplements? My neighbor's taking this, my colleague's taking that. I would say to you, the prescription of a nutritional supplement is borderline between your nutritional discipline and your nutritional indiscipline. If you're disciplined and you eat the balanced diet under the guidance of a nutritionist, because let's take, let's face it, okay? Nobody has ever been taught to eat out of science. We've all learned to eat out of love and culture. Yeah. Our parents have taught us at the dining table. Uh, you know, my mom taught, uh, put food on the table, made me like my food. And then as I've gone through life, uh, you know, you watch what your wife makes for you. She wants uh, what, what to put on the table. So it's very love and culture based. It's not scientific. Mm -hmm. And I think a woman kind of designs her entire meal plan around her family rather than her own body. So I think when we miss out on the snippets, a supplement really helps. I'm mm -hmm. huge on Siberian ginseng. Um, I've seen it works with, 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 with women with menopause. I'm huge on bioflavonoids. Mm -hmm. And for every woman that comes in, I prescribe collagen, outright collagen. It's like, Ryan, why, why collagen? So I was like, okay, when I read the research paper on collagen, it could be bovine collagen, it could be marine collagen. Now they are making variants of plant collagen, but it's got the amino acids, it's not the real collagen but it should be good enough if you're vegan or vegetarian. Now, here's the story. When I read the research paper on collagen, they found out that fine line wrinkles improve in six weeks. Elasticity of skin bumped up by 22% in six weeks and reduction in hyperpigmentation and dark spots drastically dropped by under five to 6%. So I'm thinking, lady, you're gonna wanna love my program so I can't prescribe makeup to you to look to make your skin glow. But if I write collagen at 10 grams a day in six weeks, you're going to come back very happy. And you're going to be like, Ryan, I want to follow more of the diet. So this is a secret tip that I would give all women. You could make your bone broth soup, which will release collagen into it. So it's called bone broth or collagen soup. You can Google this up on the internet, or you could buy a ready-made collagen either marine or bovine be careful some of you are allergic to fish so you get collagen based from fish source and, and to give you food for thought if you look at the japanese the koreans mm -hmm. they do a lot of stews which are marine based and seaweed based and if you look at their skin it's very porcelain like mm -hmm. so you want to take a little bit of input or just just google up can menopausal women take collagen what does collagen do to my body is collagen safe to take? What is the dose of collagen? Because collagen is a protein. So if this is one gift that I could give to all our listeners today, it would be uh, supplement with about five to 10 grams of uh, collagen. Uh, best time to take it after Philippa's workout. You have done your Pilates. Do we need a reformer bed to do Pilates? Uh, 
no, Ryan, but can I just interject on the... Yes, please, please, please interrupt me. This is your show and my show. Let's let's just go and banter because we want to give as much information yeah. out there. So, um, you know, I mean, collagen synthesis, it's not just in the skin, is it, collagen? It's, it's in every tissue. Uh, and so muscle, ligament, cartilage... And uh, you were kind of mentioning earlier about, is this why our hips start to ache? Balancing on one leg isn't necessarily going to make your hips start to ache, but the collagen synthesis is affected by the shifting hormones of menopause uh, and not just in the skin. So, you know, you are potentially more prone to a ligament injury because of this, to a tendon injury. There's definitely research around that. And that's actually the, um, the cartilage in the, uh, that covers our bones in joints such as the knee and the hip can be affected due to this uh, shifting collagen synthesis. And, and so the quality of the cartilage is affected, it's compromised, and that can lead to degenerative joint changes and so joint aches and pains and such like. So, so I think the, uh, the far-reaching consequences of collagen we should consider as well. It, it isn't just in the skin, is it? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, Philippa, if, uh, I work with some of the most elite athletes in the world. And, um, you know, when I tell them it's going to work on your joints and ligaments, people are not able to visualize that, whoa, this is going to be the lubrication between my knee and my ACL and stuff like that. And it's the building block protein matrix and all so i was like you know what let's just go with skin because once, with they're, once they're hooked on skin inside i'm repairing everything and they're going to be like i feel like a million bucks and you know then she's oh. like a ballerina at that point and stuff like that but i i think in today's discussion if there's something that we can safely allow people to take provided they don't have a food allergy to the source of the food source of collagen, I think collagen would be number, number one on my list. But in India, you know, uh, Philippa, I have a collagen. Uh, I, I've uh, made a collagen and I actually sell it on, on a website called supplement.in because uh, my wife one day pulled my leg and she's, she was having collagen from different brands and she said okay. to me, this tastes really bad and you're such a big shot nutritionist and you, you, you talk about all of this. Why can't you design a nice tasting collagen? So I spent one year, did a beautiful tasting collagen, uh, but there's an unfortunate problem in our part of the world. Majority of our population is vegetarian. Oh, yes. So yes. I want to give one tip to the vegetarian population for those of you who are checking in from India or vegetarian or vegan. Proline, hydroxyproline and lysine are three important amino acids in cartilage synthesis. So if you can find the foods that are high in proline, hydroxyproline, uh, methionine also, I forgot methionine and lysine, you could command your body to make its own collagen. By the way, uh, Philippa, just for, for the scientist out there who's going through menopause, you're absolutely right. We don't absorb protein into our blood. We take the collagen, we break it down. So collagen is like a card dealer and has that ha pack of cards and says, okay, I'm going to give you all these amino acids in your blood. And then your blood takes it to the liver and the liver sends different amino acids, packaged it. And then Philippa's knee is just done like a... I don't know what pose, whatever you call on standing on one knee and that knee's like, okay, we had a 30 minute class today on this knee, calling up the liver, please send in some amino acid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're sending some amino acids, glutamines coming in, branch chain coming in. I said, oh, branch chain amino acid makes up 30% of a woman's muscle. Philippa, you've got to be taking five grams of branch chain amino acids during a workout. Oh, Ryan, how should I do that? Uh, well, your liver is going to ask for it during the workout. So just dunk in five grams of BCA in your green tea during the workout. Uh, by the way, Plain BCA is extremely bitter. So you might want to get a flavored version, but um, the other amino acids, proline, hydroxyproline, would come in from your protein supplement. Mm -hmm. And for women, I would probably do a soy protein or a tofu or a tempeh at least twice or thrice a week to kind of give you the soy as your flavors. Philippa, with yeah, regards I to exercise. My brain is totally bombarded at this point <laughs> with all that information. Ryan, you are an absolute mine of information, honestly. It's I'm, going so to, I'm going to send this across to you, Philippa, and I'm going to put this on the video. So oh, okay. these are things that people could do from a nutritional point of view. Because, Philippa, what I want the world to realize is that we tend to turn to medicine immediately to heal us. 
प्लीज अंडरस्टैंड वन थिंग बिफोर द एडवेंट ऑफ मेडिसिन द ह्यूमन रेस डाइड और हील्ड इट सेल्फ हु हील्ड इट योर ओन बॉडी एंड सो द एवोल्यूशन हैज मेड योर बॉडी अंडरस्टैंड द लैक ऑफ न्यूट्रिय and the excess of nutrients and the wrong nutrients and the right nutrients i think if if every woman just sat down and made a list and this is a simple exercise philippa i want you to do before we finish off 2021 keep a small food diary write down the foods you eat okay and when you get up in the morning take a deep breath both nostrils if they are clear if they are clear whatever oh, yeah. food you ate 24 hours ago has not created mucus mm. and your sinuses are not clogged tick mark all those foods you love now i'll share with you how i discovered it i am allergic to chocolate okay oh, that's so awesome. i i did the food food intolerance test there's chocolate there's peanut there's whey, there's milk and there's wheat for me so if i eat any one of these foods when i get up in the morning it's completely clogged my wife has nudged me five times a night that i've snored <laughs> right so i want people to be sherlock holmes of their own body keep the food diary right mm-hmm. then we have a bowel evacuation we go to potty all of us potty on the planet i always tell women check out if you had a great potty a okay potty or a down potty now don't ask me to describe that to you but it's much like your spouse some days your spouse is very good some days your spouse is intermediate and some days you just want to disown your spouse it's same with your poop at the end of the day <laughs> well you know that is fascinating actually and, and that is something that does uh, bother us more during this menopause time digestive challenges and uh, and the body the inputs and the outputs and your body is dealing with things that it used to quite happily contend with and then all of a sudden it's it's really not working it's it's whatever you're doing is not working anymore so um so you know i i like the nostril idea and i and i definitely um you know some people struggle with sinus trouble the whole time and maybe it could be as simple as food uh, i I'd, i'd love to think that because you know it is only I, food it yeah, is only I, food I'm totally on that page with you that mo- movement is medicine and food is medicine and if only we could uh you know return to some of these traditional values herbs herbs and uh, uh you know things ground up from a root in the garden uh <laughs> I mean I I absolutely absolutely concur that if we if we can listen in and tune in is the other thing with our bodies that you know we're so busy going about our lives mindlessly not really connecting with how we feel in our mind how we feel in our bodies how we feel in our gut and and if we can make those connections deeply then we can really start to notice whether or not the the food is affecting us um and so i i do i'm definitely going to t- keep the diary because uh you know because the other thing is that we kind of are very good at cheating ourselves and persuading ourselves that the, the, it's not what i'm eating or it's not what i'm doing i you know but then when you actually commit the pen to the paper the truth kind of you, you're staring the truth in the face and uh, and that's really powerful actually you know and and um and so food is fuel food is nourishment but you know is there a role for intermittent fasting this is something that we're hearing such a lot about aren't we it's very topical at the moment yeah so from a menopause point of view so um uh, i have the privilege of having a, a, a very gifted team with me uh, we have about 54 dietitians on my team here in india and we work globally <laughs> Uh, they're all women they're all women on my team they're just two boys on the team uh and and uh for me understanding the the female hormonal cycle it's at work every day but intermittent fasting is a discussion that we have had on the team and especially for the menopausal uh, patients or women who have gone through menopause let me break it down evolution did not have fridges in the past yeah. evolution in the past 
did not have seas all year round food. We had seasonal fruit. Evolution in the past grew crops where you had abundance at one season of the year, spring and summer, and then autumn it tapered off and winter was fasted. So I do believe that if we take the last hundred years, man has evolved faster than it's ever evolved. Yeah. But our genetics have not changed as much, which is why hypertension, diabetes, you have menopausal women much larger today as compared to their grannies mm -hmm. or great grannies. So intermittent fasting from my book after researching is a thumbs up. But it has to be done from a woman's perspective. I would advise most women to not do the early morning and late uh, breakfast because I've analyzed it from an emotional point of view, a household point of view, a food availability point of view, and a woman's Im uh, psychology point of view. You should feed through the day, eat dinner as early as possible, as early as possible, because then you can get up in the morning and start your Pilates, you can start your yoga, you can mm -hmm. be in a fed state. And mm -hmm. once you're fed as a woman in menopause, you feel invincible. And because you feel invincible, you plow through the day. And then because you're getting older, by the time three o'clock comes down, you begin to relax, you have your cup of tea. In today's world, because of electricity and the internet, and we work in different time zones, women are forced to work on those high energy levels between three and 10 o'clock at night. And I think that's not working for her, her hormones at that point once she's gone through menopause. So uh, we need to tone down the lights. We need to work harder in the first part of the day, eat mm -hmm. in the first part of the day. And mm -hmm. I do believe that whoever's done this has been able to uh, have better fat loss. And for me, I've if I, if, if I have, if I, if Philippa, if you came to me and I put a scale of 100, mm -hmm. uh, I would immediately in my mind put 60% to fat because the moment a woman comes to me for a diet plan, she doesn't understand the medical, the technical, the hormonal, the exercise, the herbs. She just understands my body doesn't look how it looked 20 years ago. Can you get rid of this fat? But for me, that 60% is psychological, intermittent fasting really helps in targeting that fat burning, provided she's aware of her muscle. She's done a muscle check and she knows she has 22 kgs or 16 kgs or 12 kgs or 55 kgs, whatever her weight is of, of muscle and how much of fat. And she takes that muscle and chisels away the fat. And again, Philippa, I tell people, intermittent fasting and exercise if done scientifically and correctly not how bertha is doing it my neighbor's a crossfit trainer oh my neighbor's philippa she's a pilates trainer i'm just going to start pilates and i'm not going to plan my diet i'm not going to plan my exercise i think the haphazard approach would give you haphazard results and so one in ten women would get hit the nail on head and she would like oh i got this and then suddenly all her neighbors are following her diet plan which is more of fluke than uh, you know, scientific deduction. Uh, yeah. Intermittent fasting can be seriously deep dived by wearing a continuous glucose monitor, get one of those patches on, work with a qualified dietitian or a nutritionist, and be truthful to yourself with your food diary. So uh, uh, I, I'm not a woman, but uh, uh, I, I eat jam biscuits oh. on Sundays. On Sundays, I have jam biscuits. I have gluten-free jam biscuits. Why do I have gluten-free jam biscuits? Because I did my DNA test. Mm -hmm. Sunday evening, I have my cuppa. I have my five jam biscuits. But when I was wearing the CGM monitor, I saw a four o'clock sugar spike, massive sugar spike. Mm -hmm. So in a day when the other days I was not having a, 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 a biscuit. So I was in denial that I psychologically needed to have these biscuits because it's a childhood thing that jam biscuits and, you know, I'm Sunday de-stress. So with the same psychology, which is genderless, right? We all cheat. We all use food as a, as a comfort perspective. Uh, I would advise people to keep a food diary, keep a monitoring device if you can afford it. If you can't, just keep a food diary. Watch your weight, watch your fat percentage, and every six months do a blood test for the nutritional deficiencies of the vitamins and minerals. People are not doing that. Doctors are looking at liver, kidney, cholesterol profile, your hemogram, how your eosinophils, how's your ESR. They're not asking for a vitamin and mineral test because 
med medicine at this point doesn't say that nutritional deficiency is the cause of your disease, but it is the reason of most of our uh, issues in life. Yeah, I mean, isn't that the truth? It, <laughs> the system is kind of set up to perpetuate the medical model. And, uh, and undoubtedly, you know, there's the role for that. But, but food as fuel, food as nourishment, food as medicine, uh, it's definitely on my agenda. And, and you know, you, you kind of mentioned then about the, sh the sugar spike it doesn't just come with um, uh, the sugar spike, but it has accompanying emotions associated with it. And then the subsequent uh, drop down and cravings. And so, you know, we kind of think we're being kind to ourselves by giving ourselves a treat in inverted commas. And, and actually we're just totally undermining the, um, what, what would be the status quo of feeling fantastic all the time, you know? And so as soon as we start to do this, that's when, you know, it's really a challenge to, to feel fantastic all the time. And let's, you know, I really want women to feel fantastic all the time. And so with movement and food, I really, you know, I said that it's a match made in heaven, Ryan, but you know, quite rightly, the scientific approaches are, are demonstrating that we are unique, we are totally individual. And although there are um, generalities that we can apply in our lives, um, and, you know, and definitely we've talked about quite a lot of those when it comes to Pilates, how much should we do in a week, how much should we do uh, in a day, uh, you know, and these are general guidelines, but we do want people to start to do more rather than less. And so we've got to make it manageable for people to, to you know, because if we said you should exercise seven days a week for an hour, then they might just not do anything at all. So we've got to make it manageable for people. But equally, there is that I, as a physiotherapist, tailor the work that I do to the individual needs of my clients' bodies. And for the most part, you can't get to being in your 50s and in your 60s without experiencing some kind of aches and pains or um, body uh, issues, you know? So Philippa, Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking um, yeah. when, when, when women come to our nutrition clinic, I constantly tell them hire a personal trainer, hire mm -hmm. a personal Pilates instructor, hire a, a personal yoga trainer. And you just mentioned a point, you, you're, you're in your 50s and 60s. And I see a lot of people doing these high intensity trainings or low intensity training. So the first thing, my, my question is two parts, because I want the audience to, to understand what what tools they need to do is when they go out to a gym or find a trainer or find somebody online is one why is it important to take personal tailor-made advice why is it better than a group class what are the pros and the cons of getting a personal guided approach and should i do high intensity or low intensity because i got these women who are you know i'm in the gym uh, and i see these ladies and so I, I, I want to go up to them and say, auntie, please don't run on the treadmill. Please just walk. You're like 60 years of age. Please just walk. And they're like, you can make out they've never gotten on a treadmill. So even the way they're running is like, you can just see the knees going in another week's time. So how important is personal advice and high intensity or low intensity? How would you approach it for everyone watching in today? Well, everybody's starting point is different. And so it may be like me that you've always done a regular exercise throughout the whole of your life and you acquire a level of experience and expertise that is cumulative. And, uh, and so, you know, I have friends who run marathons well into their 60s and potentially into the 70s. Now, I think marathons are, are slightly draining for the body and maybe we're overdoing it with a marathon, but... I make the point that it's I agree with you. I agree with you. I think 10 kilometers is enough, but oh, no, no, you're quite right. Yeah. So, uh, but to be able to do these things as we continue, you know, as the clock continues to tick is, is kind of dependent on what I said earlier, which is the how, the how are we moving? So 
High intensity interval training has its benefits undoubtedly. We know that high intensity interval training will give you the, the brain chemistry shift that will lift and levitate the mood. But there's also research that shows that if we just move a bit longer, we're going to have the same or similar effects. So that maybe if you're not working quite at such a high intensity, you just need to do it for that little bit longer to have the same effects. And the biggest thing that I see in my clinic is that people who suddenly embark on a new regime of exercise, particularly over lockdown, I mean, I was horrified with some of the things that people were doing with online videos, um, you know, unsupervised. And the next thing, they're on the physiotherapy couch because they don't have the proper form, the proper technique. And, uh, you know, and our bodies are becoming less resilient and uh, less... You're not able. 20 years anymore. Well, you know, we wish we were, but the reality of the situation is we're not. And uh, our tissues, you know, we may be really willing in the mind, but the tissues are changing. And, and you know, what, we have... What's, this, what's that saying? The mind is willing. The, the the spirit is willing that's but the flesh it. is weak and yeah. i think for you as a for a for a, as a physiotherapist that's that's so that's so true yeah. uh, philippa this is some amazing stuff that you've shared with us that um, people need to go long people need to go slow uh, people need to not uh, injure their bodies in fact uh, when i work out with my trainer uh, i'm 47 and i tell him I've got a slight pain over here. I'm putting the dumbbell down. Come on, sir. Come on, sir. You can do another rep. I'm like, live to fight another day. I'm going to be here when I'm 75 in this gym. So I think uh, my message to everyone out there, because I work with elite athletes and I see them retire because they hurt. Mm -hmm. A woman going through menopause, you cannot retire hurt. Because retired hurt is you on the couch, and it means then I have only the Department of Nutrition to control your weight, which means a lot of restrictions. Whereas if I have Philippa with me, you could enjoy that cheesecake, you could enjoy that Snickers bar, you could enjoy that uh, croissant in Paris with your husband or new boyfriend if you're going through menopause. I don't know, but the whole point is go slow and steady on your body and it's like, I do know that all women on the planet have an immense amount of patience. Mm -hmm. So when they have that patience, I would say, have patience with your Pilates instructor. Don't go to her and say, uh, could I fit into this dress in the next 14 days? Because that's when Christmas is coming up. It's like, no, more like 14 months. That would be the more realistic uh, trend. Philippa, we have been going great at this session. Uh, you know, uh, we're getting a lot of questions that are coming in. Uh, but since our time is restricted, you are a very busy person. I know that as am I. And it's our Sunday. We want to get back to our families. What I propose is I'm going to ask my team to get all these questions together. We're going to figure out those questions in terms of written answers. And when this video will be recorded and go online on our YouTube channels. We'll put it in the descriptor as our q and A's answered also. So it's a resource for people with menopause, women with menopause, uh, where they can come and understand. And let's do, I'll go first. What are my top five or 10 tips for women watching in? So a summary, one, get a blood test. Philippa, you're going to come in. What are the 10 tips for, for exercise? All right. So I'm going first. So I'm thinking from the nutrition department, get a blood test. If you can find out if you can do a nutrition genetic test, get that. If you've got a little extra money, get a microbiome test. Okay. So that will really tell us about the gut health. Do a food intolerance, food allergy test because you're getting older. So you don't want to put the food that's like that... Uh, if you have a nagging husband, so think of that intolerant food like your nagging husband, right? So you want to you want to get you want to get the nice husband into you, which is you know you can't change your husband. Yeah, you can, but uh, if uh, if you want, you could change the food very easily. So I'm giving you that tip. Figure out the cranky foods that are uh, irritating your gut, your hormones. Get that out of the way. Weight train, weight train, weight train with Pilates, yoga, walking, walking 
is one exercise that burns fat. I have helped women lose 17 kgs of fat in two years time, fit into dresses that they fitted at their wedding time. But it was two years of walking. It is not 10,000 steps, ladies. 10,000 is weight maintenance. More you've got, it's like, it's like a bank balance, right? Your husband gives you some money, you want to spend it. Over here, you've got a fixed deposit, which is called fat. You need to spend. Spend is your exercise. Eating is deposits. I cannot restrict your eating down to zero. I have to give you food to nutritionally survive. So keep this as a very, very important point during your perimenopause and menopause. You have to eat. You have to take nutritional supplements. My top guys would be a protein supplement preferably a soy protein. If you're not allergic to soy, uh, a green pea protein isolate. Uh, there are a few nice brands uh, on the market. Go for an organic plant-based protein. If you're not allergic to uh, milk and uh, you're not in, uh, in the BRCA family of breast cancer and ovarian cancer, then maybe dairy is okay. So a whey protein or a casein protein. Multivitamin, yes, 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 but check your calcium, magnesium, iron genes. I highly recommend coenzyme Q10 if you're on a statin. I highly recommend that you could use coffee one or two cups a day if you're a caffeine responder as per your genetic test. If you're a caffeine non-responder, taking caffeine increases your incidences of stroke and heart attack. Finally, vitamin C. Collagen and vitamin D should be your best friends. I repeat, vitamin C, vitamin D and collagen should be your best friends. They are anti-aging. They're great on your skin. There's, there's a lot. You could get in touch with me, Ryan Fernando. We do global nutritional counseling for women. I don't do uh, the, the nutritional counseling as much as my talented dietitians. I have a few specialist dietitians who deal with the female hormonal cycle. Uh, and so if you're facing problems or wherever you are in the world, we can guide you to get the diagnostics done and then you can work on Zoom with us. Philippa, your top five or 10 tips. Well, my top tip is start small and build it up. Because if we start with unrealistic expectations, then we're just we're going to fall at the first hurdle. Have a goal in mind and, and map out a journey to that goal. So something every day, if we can fit it in, and if not, five days out of seven. So somewhere in the region of uh, 40 minutes every day, 20 to 40 minutes every day of um, the walking you mentioned, but from me, from a Pilates perspective, what I'm looking to do is to build those muscles and for somewhere in the region of 20 minutes every day, or sorry, three times a week to do some kind of muscle building activity. And so I incorporate into my sessions resistance equipment. Uh, it could be, as you said, a weighted hand weight or a rubber resistance band. And uh, actually this morning I did an amazing new workout with a broom handle, would you believe it? And a towel from the airing cupboard. So, you know, there, you don't have to invest in expensive equipment for it to be totally and 100% effective. Keep it simple and you're much more likely to, to achieve your goals. And, you know, take guidance because it re there's a whole world of difference between a squat and a squat if you do it right if you do it well and you know the joints are not going to be thanking us if we're not using the proper technique the proper form and with the passage of time this just becomes more and more important to do these movements well we'll move well and you know what we'll feel well as a consequence of doing that it's so so important to incorporate some movement into every bit of our day i already mentioned putting through putting every joint in your body through its full range of motion every day i mean you know we don't even think about our fingers our hands our wrists you know um the ability to isolate movements to one bit of us is is really something that yeah exactly there you go ryan <laughs> so, that's that's difficult uh, yeah. uh, philippa if i want to do a session with you questions are coming in if people want to do sessions with you you're saying keep it simple move the range of joints take guidance mm -hmm. so 
where do I find Dr. Philippa Butler? Where do I find uh, you? Well, I'm online. I've got a website, precision.co.uk. And do you know what? It's spelt with a Z. P R E. Ah. Yeah. So don't, don't put the S in there. P R E C I Z I O N. That was, you know, extra kind of uh, funky in the, <laughs> in the graphic. I, I'm thinking you were trying to do an, uh, a Z in the yoga pose kind of thing. <laughs> but it's been wonderful having you, Philippa. It's been amazing. I hope. People in New York to Sydney, uh, across the world, uh, have access to this. The aim of today to get Philippa on board was menopausal women should work out. Muscle is the only age reversible organ. Uh, your hormones are driven by your nutritive molecules into your life. Get an understanding of the good nutrition that can help you get aware figure out the lack of molecules in you, whether it's nutritive or hormonal, figure it out with your doctor, figure it out with your nutritionist, figure it out with your body instructor. And once you get that done, figure out the pain points in your life. The pain points could come from exercise, get an expert. The pain points could come from a nutrition issue, get an expert. The pain point, which we did not discuss today, could come from an emotional standpoint. But that's another discussion for another day where we talk about the mind health of women and, and how they go through that. And um, we'll get you back on board again, Philippa, when we get the mind coach again. So this has been an amazing, amazing session with everyone. Thank you for tuning in. As in, as in traditional Indian style and in yoga, we say Namaste. Namaste. Thank you so much, Ryan. Thank you, Philippa.